Charles, can you Charles, hear me? Charles, can you hear me? Thank you, Dan. We can hear you now, um, but you're a bit echoey. But if you, but that's good. Um, so at least we've got that working. So I'd say, please uh, turn off your camera and mic for now, and we'll come back to you in due course. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes, that's very good. That's much better. Thank you. I'm sorry for this. I don't know what happened, but anyway. I'm with you. This is good. Thank you, Dan. Good. Okay. Uh, then we're going to start soon. So I'll ask you to mute your mic and your camera. Thank you. Welcome to all of those of you who logged on. Uh, please just bear with me for a few moments. We'll wait for a few more participants to log in and then we'll begin. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, and welcome to this Towards Stockholm Plus 50 webinar, the launch of the People's Environment Narrative. The event has been organized by Stakeholder Forum for a Sustainable Future in collaboration with Forum Norway, the Civil Society Unit at the United Nations Environment Program in Nairobi, and with the support of the Government of Sweden, the country host of Stockholm Plus 50. Uh, please forgive me for that little technical glitch. I'll come back to you in just a second. That was the live stream, which I had uh, neglected to mute. So apologies for that. Um, we'll come uh, 
back to you now. Um, so uh, I'm Charles Newhead, Chairman of Stakeholder Forum for a Sustainable Future and your host today from New York. I'm joined by today's moderator, Isis Alvarez, Chief Program Officer of the Towards Stockholm Plus 50 Initiative, who joins us from Colombia, and Jan Gustav Strandenes, the Towards Stockholm Plus 50 Project Manager and Senior Advisor on Governance for Stakeholder Forum for a Sustainable Future, and he joins us today from Norway. Jan Gustav and Isis are co-contributors and co-editors of the People's Environment Narrative. Now, as you can see on your screen, uh, we have a panel of special guests uh, with a diverse range of experiences and knowledge, and they'll be introduced by ESIS in the coming minutes. For those of you unfamiliar with the Stakeholder Forum, it is an international not-for-profit NGO that has, for more than 25 years, been working to advance sustainable development at all levels. Stakeholder Forum seeks to provide a bridge between those who have a stake in sustainable development and international forums where decisions are made in their name. Now, we have a bit of uh, housekeeping uh, before I hand the floor over to our moderator. Uh, we also have with us today from various locations around the world, a team of simultaneous interpreters arranged by Mr. Pierre-Yves Serenet. Uh, Serenet. Uh, many thanks to Pierre-Yves and his team for providing this valuable service today. Uh, to listen to today's webinar in French, Spanish, or English, please choose your preferred language by clicking on the interpretation icon found at the bottom of your uh, Zoom window on the right side. And please note that when choosing your preferred language, you can reduce the volume of the presenter speaking English so that you can properly hear the translation. And you had seen the earlier slides, so hopefully you've now engaged the proper language uh, that you would like to hear. Also note that the webinar is being live streamed on YouTube uh, and that all three language versions of the webinar are being recorded. And that uh, and links to them and the copy of any presentations today will be posted on the Towards Stockholm Plus 50 website uh, soon afterwards. Now a little bit about how the audience will interact. As you will see, attendee cameras or microphones will be muted as we begin and will remain throughout the webinar. Uh, we have a lot of attendees today, over 800 people registered for the event. So we might have, uh, a, you know, there, we could have as many as a couple of hundred or more joining us today. So it might be a bit tricky to invite anyone in to actually speak. Uh, but however, should we have the opportunity for to invite an attendee to speak, the host will activate their microphones and, uh, and also invite them to activate their video if they wish. However, uh, there will be two opportunities for questions from attendees. Those questions should be submitted in the Q&A window, not in the chat window. Again, please submit your questions in the Q&A window. And also, you'll be able to upvote questions in the Q&A window so that we can choose those that most of you or, or a number of you are interested in hearing about. Now, note that the chat window is for me to communicate with each other, where you can post links to matters relevant to this webinar and also share contact details with each other if you wish to. Also note that the chat will be saved and it'll be shared with you. Note that in terms of the questions, you can scroll through them as well. You can upvote them and then we will do our best to answer as many as we can. Uh, apologies in advance if we're not able to answer all the questions or if we can't bring you in to actually speak because we expect to have a lot of people today. Uh, so please now welcome uh, Isis and our panel of ex experts. Uh, Isis will deliver the first session. Uh, she is a Colombian biologist who holds a master's degree in environment and resource management. Uh, she currently works as chief program officer for the Towards Stockholm Plus 50 project and as uh, an advisory council member at the Luke Hoffman, uh, Luke Hoffman Institute. Isis has over 15 years of experience in the NGO sector, uh, working globally on community conservation and ecosystem restoration with a special focus on gender identity and has been an active member of civil society to UNEP, the SDGs and the climate and biodiversity negotiations. Isis, uh, please activate your microphone and your video and the floor is yours. Thank you, Charles. Uh, will you show my presentation? Or shall I do that from my screen? I'm happy to do so. I'll bring that up uh, right now. Okay, thank you. You, If you want to start saying a couple of words while I do that, it's up to you. Yes. So welcome, everyone. I'm really happy to see that many of you turned uh, showed up today. 
Uh, we're here for the preliminary launch of the People's Environment Narrative. The People's Environment Narrative is an uh, effort uh, for gathering and reflecting a lot of the civil society and other non-state stakeholders' uh, efforts around the environment, especially with the commemoration of the 50 years of UNEP and the 50 years of the first human environment conference back in 72. This is a part uh, from the, the PEN of People's Environment Narrative. This is part of a, of a project. It's a product that is emerging from the Towards Stockholm Plus 50 project that started in the beginning of the year. And it was aimed at engaging the widest variety of non-state stakeholders in uh, the preparations to Stockholm Plus 50. So uh, we did try to make it representative. We did try to have a very representative compilation in this uh, upcoming publication. You will see, we will have uh, many of the sectors of the constituencies represented. We did a great effort also to have those people represented to, in today's event, but it's been challenging to say the least. To, to bring everyone, you know, to have the regions represented, to have each of the constituents, uh, constituencies represented. But we felt that this was an uh, important effort. You know, civil society had been mobilizing even before 72. And since 72, when for the first time the civil society was recognized as an official invite, invited, was officially invited to the negotiations or to the event in in Stockholm, then there's like a 50 years, you know, of work, 50 years of legacy, which is also uh, one of the main uh, points or the main themes that you will see in this publication. So I will go through very quick uh, through what's in the content, content what you can find. Uh, next, please. So as this is a working construction, I'm just uh, gonna walk you through. You won't see everything. It's gonna be, I mean, we can already say it's a thick publication, uh, but we can already tell you a little bit about what the structure is. Uh, section one will have an introductory background. It is. It does represent a little bit of the past meeting the present. Um, then we have section two which is specifically on, on the proceedings uh, of, of Stockholm Plus 50 with a very important uh, history background from Jan Gustav, who was there in 1972. In section three, we have uh, civil society and other stakeholder recommendations very based on the present, on what needs to be improved. Uh, this is based on a series of uh, webinars and other events that we carried out uh, during the first half of the year uh, before uh, Stockholm Plus 50. You will see uh, key messages, key recommendations uh, uh, from civil society. On section four, you have the seven legacy papers. Some of you may have followed. We have seven uh, webinars in specific themes that we called the legacy themes, which are explained on the preface. I will go there in a bit. Uh, and you will get to see uh, very important issues such as environmental rights, as, as multilateralism, the work of uh, civil society, the Rio conventions, uh, ed education and science, for example. On section five, we tried, you know, like to, to also have a window for the efforts made by UNEP in connection with the Stockholm Plus 50 conference. So we have made we have made a small comparative analysis of the regional reports emerging from these consultations. We have outcomes from the Nas national Stockholm Plus 50 consultations. We have the Stockholm Plus 50 declaration. And we have uh, one important forum that was that was held back to back to Stockholm Plus 50 event, which was the One Planet Network Forum in the margins of sustainable consumption and production. Next one, please. Then we have on uh, section, and then well, section six, uh, we have. Uh, a reflection of other movements. We have uh, Sue Miller with us today, 
and we have Nathan Danke from one of those movements. I will go there in a bit. So as I said before, we divided this publication into different sections. Section one gives an introductory background. Uh, so this is a preface that I've written together with Jan Gustav and explains what the PEN or People's Environment Narrative is, what it's based on, how it is divided. Next one, please. So it goes and explains each of the different sections with a little bit, bit of the rationale behind those sections so that you can follow and you have a good flow throughout the reading. Next one, please. And uh, the, the final two sections, section seven and section eight, that are more looking at uh, who were behind the publication and what is the, the importance of the publication. Next one, please. So all these years of, you know, environmental, of, of efforts of civil society and stakeholders on, on the environment, we felt that we, need, we needed to have a place so that it's not just scattered everywhere, that like 10, 20, 50 years from now, they would look back and there is a precedent that they would look back and know that these you know, were the issues so that we are not in the same situation that we look back and you know, it's been like 50 years that things for advocating for things that still don't work. So section three, as I said before, it's uh, centered on civil society organizations and our stakeholders uh, recommendations, which is you know, the, the product of the of different events we had and consultations. And so all the, these ideas, you know, you can imagine it was a challenging job to try to bring it everything together into one specific document, into one specific page, into one specific chapter. But this is what we tried to do here. You can see this is a photo of uh, civil society, uh, major groups, uh, the, the global stakeholder forum, and major groups in a, uh, the Nairobi headquarters, UNEP headquarters back in 2019. Next one, please. Uh, so this is uh, within the section one, we have this specific article on the outcomes from the full day of the people's environment narrative. We had divided into clusters following the legacy themes that uh, I explained before. Next one, please. So we have the recommendations emerging for this. The idea is that this text is also a tool for many of those working on environment in, at the UN level. Uh, there are so many good ideas. There were so very rich discussions that it's a shame that they are just like lost in time. So with this effort, we aim at, you know, at having like sort of a repository where decision makers, where people who work in the environment, people at UN agencies can resort to, you know, and try to give it a boost to environmental governance. Next, please. Section six, uh, also, as I said before, it reflects uh, many of the efforts from different movements that were quite um, remarkable in the, in, during Stockholm Plus 50, so in June in, in Stockholm. So this is civil society and non-state stakeholders, key environmental concerns for the future. We invited uh, different movements, the feminist movement, the youth, uh, the faith-based uh, faith organizations. So here we have um, a specific article written by our colleague, Daniel Perel from the Baha International Community. And it's, the content is about the different activities and different analysis around Stockholm Plus 50. Next one, please. Uh, we also have the Stop Ecocide International campaign. We have with us today Sue Miller, and she will give a little bit more of an explanation about this. Next one, please. And uh, yeah, so this is just a small preview, a very small part. Uh, I will now continue to introduce you to the different uh, presenters, the different panelists we have today. They have all in a way contributed to, to this um, effort. So they will be able to talk a little bit uh, further about their own contributions. Uh, okay, thanks. So um, I'll introduce now Leda. 
So Leida Reinhardt, she's been a key advisor to stakeholder forum for many years, has worked as an independent consultant. She's currently the chief executive of the World Fair Trade Organization. And she used to, to be the chief program officer for this project before handing the role to me. Uh, in her position as executive director of AMPED and director of global policies and sustainability at the European Environmental Bureau, Leda facilitated and coordinated the global NGO community to realize their active engagement in United Nations processes on sustainable <clears throat> development and the environment. So I now give the floor to you, Leda. Thank you, Isis. And I see that you're doing a really great job. <laughs> and I'm happy to see that. Um, okay, so well, I was asked to say something or at least connect uh, the work that was done for Unibit 50 to uh, Stockholm uh, plus 50. Um, as you know, Unibit 50 also had an, 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 a declaration um, and Stockholm at plus 50 also had the declaration. But before we go to that, I think we, I would like to, uh, to go to the beginning, which was in 72, when they uh, founded uh, UNEP, the United Nations Environmental Program. And it was in 72 that it was also the start of having, for the first time, environmental governance and the start of the environmental law. Uh, it was also for the first time that we had in several countries and more and more countries, we had environmental ministers. Um, of course, in those 50 years, a lot of good things has happened. I mean, I'm not going to complain about the work of UNEP. I think we have to applaud it, especially with the resources that they have. Also in the difficult times that uh, the, the 50 years uh, we had, I mean, we had better times and good times. But I mean, it's, it's, we, I think we still face the fact that a lot of environmental policies and environmental law is still not covering all the problems and the challenges that we have. So a lot is also not done. Um, we are dealing with several issues. First of all, environmental policies, environmental law is still not the priority for the, gov for the governments, for the member states. It is still very weak. Um, another thing which is, uh, I think, uh, quite concerning is that we also see a decrease of ministers of environment. Uh, we thought, of course, in 72, that it would be very important to have ministers that are only dealing with the environmental issues. And now we see nowadays that it's that we have less ministers of environment worldwide. The reason is also is that a lot of governments and even civil society organizations think that we should mainstream environmental issues into the other sectors, like economy, like um, natural resources management, like agriculture, uh, like infrastructure, um, many things. But uh, the fact is, at least the consequence that we see is that that mainstreaming of the environmental issues is getting more and more the away streaming of the environmental um, issues. So what we see and what we, um, we are confronted with is that um, there is no enforcement, no implementation of the environmental governance and law. There are a lot of environmental laws. There, there is policy, but it's not implemented. So that is, of course, a problem because we can have all kinds of conventions, treaties, um, agreements, but if it's just paper, then it's just paper. And what we really need is the implementation, of course, of all this. In 2017, um, there was a club of jurists, French, uh, I mean, worldwide, but the in initiative came from a an, an, an French um, lawyer. They started the Global Pact for the Environment. Uh, that started a process in the General Assembly with a resolution that was adopted. I'm not going into the details that you can read it um, also in this uh, in this uh, pen, uh, in the chapter that I, uh, that I um, delivered for them. The follow-up on the General Assembly resolution was a next resolution, uh, the 73-333, the, the famous one uh, that we worked quite hard on with civil society organizations, and that gave UNEA the task to have a political declaration. And the declaration should be about to strengthen the implementation of international law and governance. So exactly putting the finger on the weak points that we need to strengthen the implementation of, in, of the international and environmental law and governance. 
Uh, it was always thought that that political declaration would be done in Stockholm, but in the end, um, they decided, I and mean, I'm not going into details again, they decided to have it at Unipet 50, uh, which was just after UNEA 5. Uh, the outcome document was a declaration, but it was very negotiated with the member states. And a lot of, I think, even effective civil society uh, input was integrated in the outcome document. It was a difficult uh, negotiation because when you talk about human rights, when you talk about enforcing international environmental law, if you talk about uh, a huge um, um, participation of civil society organizations in those processes, then you always have some countries against you. So indeed, it was a very, sometimes it was indeed very difficult. Um, but still, I can say that the outcome document, the outcome document of UNIPED 50 has hooks in it, uh, where we as civil society organizations uh, can, can, can put our codes on. I mean, it is indeed something that we can use. It's useful language. Of course, it's UN language, so it's kind of vague, but um, it is still, let's say, good enough for us to really, um, to really uh, use it. Um, one of the things that is not in, um, and of course we were not happy with that, is that uh, as civil society organizations, as, 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 as all the major groups, I mean, it was not only the NGOs, we were really asking for a kind of kickoff process um, to have an action plan. A kind of the same thing that, that we did in 2012 in the Rio Plus 20, when it was said within the text that uh, member states and civil society organizations would start working on developing an agenda 2030 uh, on uh, sustainable development. I think that is something that, that we wanted as well for for UNEP, for UNEA to do the member states, that we would have a kind of framework with, 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 with goals, real goals, I mean, principles, of course, but also goals, indicators, means of implementation, uh, which uh, includes capacity building, which includes finance, I mean, that can be related, connected with the Montevideo program, but also monitoring schemes, monitoring schemes on how far and how well are uh, governments implementing their environmental governance and law, or already the existing governance and law. Of course, uh, that did not happen, and that was really a pity, but uh, yeah, we had to deal with it. Nevertheless, there is one paragraph in the text from the UNEP 50 that says that uh, they are inviting the executive director of UNEP to identify further options within the program, the medium term strategy and the program of work to really to really have a more concrete plan on how to implement uh, all this. So I think that is something that civil society organizations should really look at uh, to, to, I mean, to, to really start working on that and not only on the, the, the topics, I mean, climate change, biodiversity, whatever, but also really on governance issues. Because without strong governance, without strong laws even, or policies, um, and the implementation of it, all the goals, all the ambitions will be only paper. I mean, good intentions. We need to have that also uh, more concrete. Uh, enforcement is also on the national level. So that means that empowering civil society organizations on the national level is also super important uh, to do that. Now going to Stockholm, I, I already see ISIS, so I think I, I'm, I already am over my time. But um, going back to, to Stockholm, as Stockholm was set up, and we were at that time quite frustrated about it as a kind of party and not a milestone, a political milestone for UNEP to go further in strengthening the, in the environmental governance and law. Um, okay, we had our party, we had our hangover, but I think next steps are that we are really going into the UNEP at 50 text, and that wasn't kind of done in a few minutes uh, during UNEA, there was some applause, but I mean, there was, I don't think there was really the attention that the document should get also from us to really follow up on that, read it very carefully, and really try to use the best sentences out of it to have the follow-up to, to do the what was expected for Stockholm to do indeed uh, the work in the strengthening the environmental governance and law. And I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Leida. Thanks for being on time. So what you mentioned is so important, no? Like uh, we really need like a legacy, like a serious 
a repository of information of initiatives that can be taken over, taken forward. So next we will continue with Daniel McGraw. Daniel, he's part of the different legacy writers, uh, legacy team writers that we had. You'll, as I said before, you'll find these seven chapters also in the PEN. Daniel is an international lawyer with experience in international law, institutions, processes, and policies, particularly relating to environmental protection, dispute settlement, investment, and human rights, including climate change and environmental justice. He's a professional lecturer and senior fellow at the Foreign Policy Institute at Johns Hopkins University, University School of Advanced International Studies and President Emeritus of the Center for International Environmental Law, CL. Professor McGraw has worked in government, non-governmental organizations, in governmental organizations, business and academia, including as a consultant to the United Nations regarding the environment, human rights and investment. So Daniel, you have the floor. Dan? Yep. Thank you very much, Isis and Leda. Thank you for your comments. Uh, welcome to all the participants. Thank you for joining us. The Stockholm Conference catalyzed a revolution in environmental rights. Uh, that revolution took a major step forward three months ago, as many of you know, when the UN General Assembly recognized the human right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable um, environment, thus changing the pantheon of human rights. The vote was 161 in favor, zero opposed, and eight abstentions. Uh, this was the most overwhelming recognition of human rights in the history of the General Assembly. The environmental rights revolution occasioned by the Stockholm Conference is broader than that, however, as described in the report that Ms. Lee Lin and I uh, wrote and that is appended to the People's Environment Narrative. Among other things, the report explains the meaning of the right to a healthy environment um, uh, and describes how the right has an empirical basis in ecosystem services. Uh, that is the benefits that nature provides to humankind for free and that are the infrastructure of human, excuse me, human society. The report also attempts to imagine the future, to eliminate the possible future legacy of the Stockholm Conference. We do this with the assistance of 45 essays, uh, including a poem and a song um, contributed by 52 thoughtful individuals of various ages from around the world. I will relate the main themes of our report, uh, which is titled The Web of Life and Rights, um, but time prevents raising many of the inspiring, challenging ideas uh, raised by the essayists. I very much hope you will take the time to read their work. You will not be disappointed. Principle one of the Stockholm Declaration is among the most revolutionary and influential pronouncements in diplomatic history. Its legacy regarding environmental rights is multifaceted, powerful, and ongoing. Principle one is pathbreaking with respect to several critical aspects of environmental rights. Most famously, of course, principle one proclaimed the human right to a healthy environment, a right that took 50 years, but we finally got the General Assembly to recognize that in July, as I mentioned. Uh, this adds a powerful overarching arrow to the quiver of uh, rights-based approach that we can use to protect rights and the planet. In so doing, principle one implicitly recognized that there's a relationship between the environment and human rights. Um, although we now know that the two areas have a reciprocal relationship, that was a radical insight at the time. Principle one also announced that humankind has a responsibility to protect and improve the environment for future generations. Another bold statement. Uh, it's been recognized by academics, some courts, um, some inter intergovernmental institutions since then, but still a very, very important idea. In addition, principle one declared that environmental protection must be free from discrimination, uh, presaging the present day movements to achieve environmental justice, to treat indigenous peoples fairly, and to provide a just transition for persons who are affected by major societal changes. 
Moreover, principle one speaks of human well being, thus clearly including human health as an environmental concern, which too many policymakers still don't understand. Finally, and this is extremely significant, the recognition of the right to a healthy environment. So now I'm moving beyond uh, principle one to the General Assembly's action uh, is vitally important quite apart from the right itself because it provides a key to approaching other critical environmental rights issues. For example, the right is the often unspoken assumption of environmental justice because there cannot be justice if the environment is destroying human lives. At the same time, the right provides a seamless, constantly adapting framework for protecting the rights of future generations. Because regardless of whatever else future generations may want or need, um, it's absolutely clear that they will want and need a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment. Uh, the right also provides a rights-based mandate for the precautionary principle and the uh, doctrine of indubio pro natura. If there is doubt about the environmental impacts of a course of action, take the path that, that does not risk violating the right to a healthy environment. And very, very important, importantly, the right uh, to a healthy environment effectively requires a new focus on protecting nature, on protecting the environment, because that right can only be protected um, if the environment itself is protected. This is one of the major themes of the report um, the environmental, excuse me, the characteristics and severity of today's environmental crises, which was later alluded to, um, have led to the realization that humankind's current attitudes towards nature, which is human supremacist and hierarchical, uh, valuing nature only in terms of its instrumental value to humans, is fatally flawed and needs to be rebalanced. We need to reset this. And, and that's uh, supported by ethical considerations as well. But empirically, uh, we're in deep trouble right now. And this attitude is not working. We need to change it. Uh, one way to do that would to be uh, to accord some sorts of rights to nature. Uh, and the report uh, explores that idea as well. We must also confront the broader inequities that are rife within societies and uh, between them. Often this means that those most impacted by environmental harm had the least to do with causing that harm and have the fewest resources to deal with it. This is inherently unjust. Environmental threats are inequity and injustice multipliers. Environmental rights as broadly construed relate to all the environmental crises facing humanity and nature. And the report contains observations about these. Similarly, environmental rights are affected by, by many cross-cutting issues and aspects of society um, in terms of both potential harms and potential solutions. Uh, let me summarize a few of the report's uh, observations about these uh, before closing. Uh, all elements of society must be involved in realizing environmental rights. This fits well with what Leda was saying. We need to connect local voices to global action this includes protecting environmental human rights defenders. It also includes incorporating the experience and wisdom of indigenous peoples. Current information and communication technology poses serious human rights threats and obstacles to effective advocacy, particularly because of the surveillance economy and the advertising driven business model of the communications mega firms. Moreover, moreover, civil society is under direct attack around the world by governments that restrict access to the internet or its equivalent. We need to harness the age of entertainment and metaverse to restore emotional uh, connections to nature and inspire people, uh, especially young people, uh, to engage in the struggle to protect nature and environmental rights. Businesses must become re responsible citizens. Uh, the time for the current behavior is past. Business as usual is not an option. Preservation of natural resources must be strengthened. Nature-based solutions that are science-based and community-based should be utilized when possible, as should rewilding. Nature is resilient if given the chance. 
Conversion of forests and wetlands to urban areas or farmland should cease and be reversed. Agriculture must be managed so that it benefits the environment, not degrades it, decreases inequality rather than increases it, and improves food security rather than diminishes it. Food must not be burned. Ultimately, the report's vision is an optimistic one. Many efforts to improve uh, or confront environmental threats have been successful, as, as, as evidenced by the recent elimination of lead from gasoline, uh, which is currently saving about one and a quarter million lives per year. And that was uh, a, a big success of UNEP. But severe threats remain and the trends on most environmental indicate, indicators are downward. The struggle must uh, continue and it will continue. And I hope uh, all of you will be, uh, will be agents of change within that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dan. Thank you for keeping time also. So now we will go to our first Q&A section. Um, Charles, I see we have a couple of questions already in the Q&A box. Uh, yes, let's take a look at those and I'll ask uh, Lida, why don't you pop back on uh, along with Dan and Isis uh, so we could take a look at the questions and see. Uh, now we have a handful of questions there. Uh, so perhaps I could ask uh, each of you to take a quick look. There, there is one uh, question from our friend uh, Javier Soraski for uh, Dan and or Lida. Uh, and it says, as I can see it, Human rights focused civil society and SC environmentals focused civil society are not taking full advantage of their common interests. Do you agree? If that's the case, how would you strengthen the links between them? Uh, can each of you uh, take a stab at that, please? Um, yeah. Go ahead, Linda. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, I think that uh, what, what civil society uh, can do mostly on the national levels is if they are really aware of what uh, kind of possibilities the, the human rights law gives, and now also including uh, the uh, this having a healthy environment as a human rights recognized, and what uh, existing treaties, conventions, um, principles, etc., are already there, but, but that can, let's say, make the difference for your national advocacy. I think that would be very good, because what I often see happening is that civil society organizations on the national levels, or even on the European level, in my case, because I, I, I live in, in Europe, they're not always aware on what kind of language there is already, I mean, agreement, not only a language, but it is an agreement is already um, there that you can use for your national and regional advocacy and, and, and pushing uh, for it. Because I think, or you have the, and the NGOs that are working um, on the national levels and they are very aware of the national uh, uh, policies and laws, etc. Or you have the international ones and they go every two years to Nairobi and are very active, etc., etc. But the link between what is done in Nairobi and, and what is agreed in Nairobi and what is implemented on the national level is not always done. And there I think that, uh, that we can make uh, big uh, advances because the is still quite uh, quite big, quite wide. Yeah, thank, thank you, Leda. Um, yeah, I agree with that. Uh, I would say that we need to educate everyone about this new right and what it means and uh, provide toolkits. We need to get it on the work programs of every one of the, for example, the 15 parts of the UN uh, system that, that um, signed the declaration supporting the right before the human rights Council considered it last October. Um, and, and we did that, by the way, with this commitment to eliminate lead from gasoline in 90. We got the commitment in 96 at Istanbul, mm -hmm. put it on UNEP's work program in 98, um, uh, got it into a public private partnership in 2002, and it finally uh, was accomplished in 2021 when Algeria stopped selling leaded gasoline at the pump. That took 25 years. But it happened. We need to do mm -hmm. the same thing with the right to a healthy environment. Mm -hmm. And I would say I expect there to be a, a normative cascade that 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 affects um, the rights to a healthy environment that are in uh, the many constitutions around the world and national legislation. But we have to keep in mind that each country is different. The environmental conditions are different. The legal systems are different. 
And, and so that'll be expressed and realized in different ways. But this is a huge challenge. It's a huge opportunity. I'm very excited mm -hmm. about it. And um, yeah, all ideas are welcome. And on, maybe on the second question on the fora, on the, on the UN, um, I worked for several years uh, with the, the Human Rights Councils on environmental uh, law. I mean, even if it was not recognized, I mean, the human rights. And you're there, you have the monitoring system of the UPR. Um, and that is something that is quite strong also for environmental organizations and as and, and human rights organizations, indigenous communities, etc. cetera. Um, I'm happy to share the links, but uh, we made reports for uh, for Paraguay to some Tanzania, Belgium, um, Holland, where we clearly proved that uh, those countries are not respecting human rights um, related to um, environmental issues, which can be air pollution, which can be uh, water pollution, which can be doing nothing on um, climate change. I mean, there are several uh, things that you can do. And I think that's something that is quite strong because a few years ago, and now also, again, by the way, the Holland, um, in my case, <laughs> is was, um, I mean, was, was um, told by the Human Rights Council that they were not respecting the human rights. Uh, and that is something that is, of course, front page news. Um, and that is very, I think, is a very powerful tool for uh, civil society organizations, national civil society organizations to uh, to to work and that focus and pushing for respecting the human rights related to uh, environmental issues. Yeah, if I could add that one of the recommendations of our report is that uh, the right to a healthy environment be included in the UPR, which for those mm -hmm. of you who aren't human rights yeah. gurus or mavens, the UPR is a universal periodic review. Uh, it, through that process, the Human Rights Council reviews the human rights performance of every country. Um, mm -hmm. and, and it does it on a periodic basis, uh, as the name would suggest. And uh, there's no reason this shouldn't be front and center in that, in that review. Yeah. Uh, thank you both for those very informative and, and thoughtful comments. Uh, there are some other questions. I want to just first, uh, there's one that came in uh, just a few moments ago, which is, how can we make a strong link between urban spaces and natural resources, such as protected area, national parks, and so on, to help protect the natural ecosystem? Um, it's a bit somewhat broad question, but I'm wondering if one of you might take a stab at it. It would it would vary. It's a great question and a very important issue. It would vary by uh, local area, obviously. But one of the potentials of that kind of question is that, it, at least in the United States, it uh, raises the possibility of including both uh, liberals and conservatives, Democrats and Republicans, in those efforts. Because often at the local area, the um, the conservation trusts. Are are um, have have very strong and sometimes dominant, um, or not dominant, but majority uh, participation by uh, people that otherwise are not inclined to uh, support, for example, climate change action. Uh, so these local efforts can be extremely important. Um, Thank you, Dan. Mm -hmm. um, Ida, do you want to add anything, or Isis? If not, there are another question. We'll move on to. Yeah, no, I, I just say, I just want to say that we have like many different interesting questions, I would say like 10 questions, unfortunately, we cannot answer all of them due to time. Uh, one that caught my attention is the one, uh, the first one, which is in French. I think it is a little bit about uh, that he wants to know how the different questions well, I would leave that to the... Lida, Lida, could you take a stab at that? You're, you have some... Yeah, I have some knowledge of friend. I, I think that was the same question that I saw la uh, later on as well. I mean, how to make the connection uh, with the environment and the uh, and the questions on the um, human rights. I think that is Daniel, I mean, went quite into that. Um, and, and I mean, I think it is important, I mean, first of all, that, that we are more aware of the fact what impact can that have for also for the national legislation. 
um, on how to put the environment higher on the agenda, because I think for a lot of countries, not all, of course, but I mean, for a lot of countries, human rights is, is quite high on the agenda, or at least uh, they say it's high on the agenda. You can now, I think, more easily integrate environmental issues as well, because damaging the environment is a human rights issue as well. <laughs> And I think there you can indeed uh, absolutely, uh, I think that's also for us, uh, meaning more capacity building, more, more getting the knowledge on how to do this. And again, I think looking at the Human Rights uh, Council and the processes they have um, for um, also uh, declaring uh, that your uh, country is not respecting human rights, I think is also quite and quite obvious way in, in putting it higher on the agenda. Just to add a little bit to that, I, I think one of the critical realizations has to do with ecosystem services. Uh, I mentioned that in my comments, obviously. Um, once one realizes how important nature is to society and that it's the infrastructure of society, uh, it, it becomes a different kind of policy priority. And obviously it's related to all human rights. You simply can't have uh, human rights protected if, the, if nature is uh, being destroyed um, under this, uh, as the basis of society. The society won't be able to exist that way. So, um, but I am, as a professor, I'm deeply discouraged by how few of my students are taught about ecosystem services uh, in their uh, different national uh, educational systems. Um, but I, I, I think that offers an avenue into to, um, to answering that question. Thank you, Dan. Mm -hmm. and thank you for your questions. Thank you, Leida. I think we, because of time, we need to go to the next session. However, I would advise uh, Leda and Dan, if you could respond to some of these questions in the Q&A box, like reading questions. I would just would like to say that, uh, you know, through the work on the investigation, the research we were doing uh, for the PEN, we found very interesting proposals on uh, environmental law. It's that some instruments that could work because there was like a definitely a gap in implementation, like widely recognized by most of civil society. And there's a lot of um, will to work around this. And I am sure governments will also want to work around that. And there are very good ideas for instruments in international law that could address that. And uh, I think uh, our friend Sue would address that in a bit, uh, but now we will continue with session two. We will start with uh, our colleague Dalia Marquez from the youth movement. Dalia Fernanda Marquez Añez is a lawyer from Venezuela who holds a master's degree in human rights. She's been a professor at the Faculty of Law of the Universidad Católica El Táchira for seven years. She is the founder of the NGO Juventud Unida en Acción and has been regional facilitator for Latin America and the Caribbean to UNEP. Dalia was also youth advisor for the TUNSA strategy of UNEP, global focal point for SDG 12 of the United Nations major group and children and youth, and is fellow of the Generation Change Exchange Program with His Holiness the Dalai Lama. So I give the floor to you, Dalia. Thank you so much, Isis. So I, I would like to highlight some few things, but first of all, I want to say that since 1972 with the Stockholm Summit, the international community has taken an important step to ensure uh, the care of the environment and to guarantee a healthy environment for present and future generations at that moment. Unfortunately, However, today, after 50 years since the Stockholm conference or summit, my generation is facing and living with the consequences of environmental deterioration, degradation, and the triple planetary crisis. We are witnesses now of the climate change, loss of biodiversity, pollution, air pollution, water pollution, soil degradation, etc. All this led us to reflect 
what we have been doing the last 50 years is not enough to guarantee intergenerational equity. The principle of intergenerational equity assumes that human beings are part of environment and because of their intelligence and the ability to think, human beings have the duty to take care for the planet and ecosystems for future generations. The intergenerational rights, such the intergenerational equity, involves the rights of future generations, which constitute a mere expectations of their possible existence. We know, or I know, that to achieve intergenerational equity is not an easy task. It requires commitments and actions beyond conversations and meetings or conference without commitments. And I need to highlight this. We really need actions and commitments more than words. The most affected due to the lack of intergenerational equity uh, and concrete actions in the present will be the children and the young people of today and the future generations who will live with the decisions that we make now in these times. Today, the right of a health environment has been recognized by the UN as a human right. So when we speak of intergenerational equity, in its sense linked with health environment, we are speaking about human rights. There is the importance of really trying to achieve this intergenerational equity. But to achieve this, I would like to share with all of you some of the main recommendations of the youth policy paper of Estocolm Plus 50. This was uh, the result of a lot of different consultations around the world in all the regions in which one the young people have the opportunity to share the expectatives about the future and some recommendations to achieve a healthy environment for all the present and future generations. So first of all, we need to address unsustainable consumption and production systems by a commitment to principles that promote a circular economy such as ensuring the use of life cycle analysis, a design sustainable manage of waste and production systems respectively. In the same breath, recognizing that for the prosperity for all resources produced and managed by this principle should aid in closing the results inequality gap. We need to protect and restore all the ecosystems by helping the forest stations, banning bottom traveling on sustainable meaning and other environmental destructive practices. Also, it's really important to recognize ecocide as a crime in the Rome Estatute of the, and include it, this recognition in the national rules. After the pandemic, of course, is key to achieve sustainable and inclusive recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. And for this, it's necessary to adopt a science-based approach in policy making. Acknowledge the role of biodiversity loss and climate change in increasing the risk for future, future zootonic diseases and health hazards. We need to ensure transparent sharing information and scientific findings between different institutes and between the countries, promoting the South-South cooperation, North-South cooperation and triangular cooperation. Also, it's important to accelerate implementation of the environmental dimension of sustainable development in the context of the decade of action. And for that, we need immediately establish a fossil fuel non proliferation treaty to phase out fossil fuels and scale up 100% safe, clean, and sustainable energies for all in order to reach net negative emissions by 2050. 
course, stakeholders must participate in decision making spaces because we need to ensure inclusive processes for decision making, uh, taking into consideration even the most vulnerable as children and youth, by example. For this, it's important to adopt participatory and inclusive decision making processes at every level, national, local, international, and global level, to ensure the meaningful engagement of all right holders, stakeholders, highlighting youth, young people, and those most strongly affected by the triple planetary crisis as women and indigenous communities, safeguarding the peaceful democratic order, order through the principles of press freedom, free speech, free and fair elections, and the protection of all the youth activists and environmental defenders across the world. It's important increased investment in children and youth through target programs, support the civil society organizations, entrepreneurs, and marginalized groups, recognizing that investing in children and youth gives a strong leverage toward a sustainable future. To close, I would like to highlight that the current world system is not delivering on its pledge toward a sustainable future. Time is running out, and we have had enough. It is the final hour to move beyond empty words and broken promises. This time is the time to turn in point toward a better, bigger future for all, redefining our relations with nature. Therefore, it's so important call for all the stakeholders, governments, decision makers to take actions and commitment in the short, medium, and long term. Uh, the time is now. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Dalia. Thank you so much for that. I will now continue with our next presentation. He, he, let me introduce you to Jorge Laguna Celis. Uh, Jorge Laguna has been now for a decade part of the United Nations Environment Program. He, is, uh, he has been contributing to advancing strategic partnerships, sustainable development and environment programs uh, with the United Nations. In his current role as head of the One Planet Network, he's overseeing a global network of practitioners, policymakers, and experts working on a transformative new agenda for achieving SDG 12. Prior to that, Mr. Laguna was director of UNEP's Governance Affairs Office, where he was responsible for the UN Environment's policy making organs, including the United Nations Environment Assembly, and for the organization's engagement with civil society and business and industry organizations. So Jorge, the floor is yours. You're on mute, you need to unmute. Still can't hear you. No, I am sorry. I had the screen lost uh, uh, because my system quit it unexpectedly. We've been having connection problems. Uh, I don't often say that, uh, but in this case, uh, it, it is. I'm so pleased. I'm delighted to be here with you, with so many friends. I see a few here on the screen. I would like to make this screen larger to see all these wonderful 210 faces, maybe I know many of you have had the privilege to interact with you. Today, uh, you have invited me to share really some informal perspectives. I wouldn't dare to say on behalf or officially on behalf of the United Nations Environment Program, because as you have rightly mentioned, I am only leading now a small, relatively important component of the program that had an important engagement in the Stockholm Plus 50 conference. My uh, friend, Ligia Noronha, director of the New York office, sends her regards and also regrets. She is now chairing a, a meeting of the Environment Management Group where we are discussing pathways to implement the outcomes of Stockholm Plus 50. So take this both as personal reflections, 
but also institutional reflections. From a personal perspective, I have been, like many of you, a fellow traveler of the sustainable development movement for the last 15 years. I had the privilege of seeing uh, uh, organizations be born, like the High Level Political Forum. I have also seen institutions uh, conclude its life cycle, like the Commission on Sustainable Development, and uh, we have advanced together with you in our different portfolios in wherever uh, we have managed to interact and engage the processes that have led the spaces and the stakeholder opportunities that have led to the outcomes of Stockholm Plus 50. From my perspective, and also echoing the position of UNEP, uh, to with regards to Stockholm Plus 50, Stockholm Plus 50 is at the same time a point of culmination and a point of departure. It is a point of departure because those of you that are familiar with the uh, sustainable development movement know that some of the processes take time. Some of the processes, intergovernmental agreements, inclusive, significant outcomes, take time to be prepared. Yet, unfortunately, we don't have today the luxury of time. We all have to join our forces to do one thing, implement the agreements and the commitments that have been already made. Implementation has to be our leitmotiv, but also being increasingly focused on where are the gaps in the international environmental governance that have to be addressed as a matter of priority. And let me just speak about three major gaps that Stockholm Plus 50 in its outcomes launched and highlighted. First and foremost, it is creating this movement towards the e implementation of a human right, a universal human right to a clean and healthy environment. Thankfully, by now, after Stockholm, thanks to the support of Stockholm, the General Assembly. Can you hear me? It says here that the voice is gone. We can hear you. Ah, okay. Um, the General Assembly recognized the right to a clean and healthy environment. Our efforts, our energy in the next years has to be to translate into what exactly does that mean? How can we all work together to put in practice a right to a clean and healthy environment and the mechanisms that are required. The second outcome that you have mentioned, Dalia, and that I think we all agree it is high time to come up with a reflection on what it exactly means to give future generations a seat at the table. What is required to emphasize, strengthen the normative and also the ethical necessity to create the space to accept the rights that uh, future generations have, and how can we use that to manage our resources more sustainably? We, in the past, at uh, HLPF uh, and at Rio Plus 20, discussed institutional figures. I think it is important that we look at those debates and understand what type of interventions, what type of engineering is required. The third element that I would like to share with you that struck me personally, but also, I think, institutionally, from the outcomes of Stockholm Plus 50, it is the uh, alignment of public, private, and social interests for the environment. And we believe that in this case and in this regard, it is absolutely essential to accelerate the transformation of the high impact sectors and systems that are driving the triple planetary crisis. Science tells us that if we make interventions in the food systems, in the built environment and also in the uh, mobility or in the infrastructure that manages our movements and our transfers of goods, those three sectors, transportation, buildings and constructions and the food systems are critical to address the planetary crisis, the implementation of the Paris Agreements and the implementation of the forthcoming goals on biodiversity. Therefore, to transform those systems, we need to move beyond the current sphere of discussions, intergovernmentally led, and understand a new compact in which private sector, civil society, consumers, individuals, governments all can create 
pathways and avenues for transformation of these specific systems and value chains. And this is what we are doing in the One Planet Network at the level of sustainable consumption and production in creating a global movement for SCP-12, SDG-12 and sustainable consumption and production. And I want to praise the UN major group, uh, Children and Youth, Dahlia, all the wonderful constituencies that are looking and picking up these pieces through, I can make a commercial, the assembly, the youth assembly for SCP. We need your voices to bring this debate forward. So in conclusion, I would say that from my perspective, and this is what I would really like to emphasize here, I see four major outcomes of Stockholm Plus 50. The first one, as I mentioned, it is to recenter the global attention on implementation, implementation, implementation. The second one, it's to identify two major gaps. One, on what does it mean to implement a right to a clean and healthy environment, therefore bringing all the normative, ethical, human rights agendas with the environmental agendas in the heritage of the Stockholm 1972. Third, how can we understand, provide ethical, effective solutions to rethink the role of future generations? That I think it's key, and we will be, uh, I will, encouraging you to continue making those proposals to see what uh, can be done. And last and not least, uh, it is to transform systems and value chains, specifically those that are creating the highest impact, which will require completely new models of cooperation, of engagement and delivery going beyond the traditional multilateral system. Thank you once again for inviting me to this incredible valuable discussion. Congratulations on the publication. We are very happy that we managed to put a little a component there. Thank you for opening the space and uh, looking forward to working closely with all of you. Thank you very much, Jorge. Now we will continue with Sue Miller from the Stop Ecocide International Movement. Um, just a minute. Sorry about that. So Sue Miller is head of global networks at Stop Ecocide International. She has been working with teams and groups across the world to make ecocide the fifth crime against peace at the International Criminal Court. She's a former lawyer, legal communications director and vegan entrepreneur. Sue has served on the boards of a number of charities and nonprofit organizations. So Sue, the floor is yours. Thank you, Isis. Um, yes, well, thank you for the introduction and thank you very much for inviting me. Um, uh, so sort of by way of quick background for those of you who don't know um, about Stop Ecoside and, and the movement, Stop Ecoside International is the hub for the global movement, as Isis said, to make Ecoside the fifth crime at the International Criminal Court. Um, and it would sit there alongside genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes and crimes of aggression. Now our movement has grown exponentially in the last few years. In 2020, um, our foundation convened a panel of independent experts to come up with a definition of ecocide. Um, that definition now to our knowledge is being or has been discussed at governmental level in at least 24 countries. Now we see ecocide as an essential piece of the framework of measures being created to protect the earth and future generations. Because as long as serious and widespread damage to nature remains legal and its perpetrators are unaccountable, it will continue to happen regardless of whatever pacts, agreements, goals or targets might be put in place. It's just simply too easy to carry on with established and profitable practices. Ecocide law would see those key decision makers facing personal criminal responsibility and possible imprisonment, and they would not be able to lose um, ecocidal activity on their balance sheets. So Stockholm Plus 50 was a symbolically really significant event for Stop Ecocide, as it marked 50 years since the first use of the word ecocide by the Prime Minister at the time, Olaf Palmer. Um, and we had high hopes of getting it onto the um, agenda for discussion. 
um, our preparation, like that of many of the other stakeholders, was to participate in the programme of workshops leading into, um, feeding into the leadership dialogues. And at the end of the process, the synthesis report from the dialogues highlighted key recommendations. The first of which was criminalize ecocide and protect environmental defenders. So we were pretty happy with that. And we were looking forward to getting ecocide on the agenda at the UN for the first time. However, when the final report to the conference was published, ecocide no longer featured. There was no indication of why it had been removed. And we were quite disappointed, if not um, completely surprised. We knew and know that there's still some timidity um, at political level. However, we were undeterred um, and we had a full slate of events planned for the duration of the conference, both as part of the official and the unofficial programmes. And we had a number of really high level speakers um, for our panels. We had former president um, Halonen from uh, of Finland. We had the um, US attorney and environmental activist Steve Donziger, um, Chief Rayoni of the Kayopa people of Brazil, Ralph Chami um, of the IMF. Uh, we had environmental champions, Nima Basi and then Dahi Bastida. So, so we felt we had a pretty good, we had the A-team <laughs> speaking for us. Um, there was also a big event at the Space Arena in Stockholm, which was organized with several partners um, and looked at Ecoside from a number of different angles, political, legal, financial. And we even had musical with a performance from the Sibelius uh, Academy from Finland. And also uh, Stop Ecoside featured um, quite significantly in the Youth March on the Friday of the conference. Um, and they, we've got some great pictures of the, of the young people out there with their Stop Ecoside banners. Um, so that was uh, fantastic. All in all, we made a great big noise in Stockholm and we refused to be ignored. The groundwork we've been doing over the last few years, oh, sorry, I'm blocking you. <laughs> to build networks um, and the contacts we've been making uh, and the case we've been making, we felt were really starting to resonate. And by the end of Stockholm Plus 50, we felt we had been heard and we know we had been heard by a number of major stakeholders. So what did we have by the end of it? Possibly before, but vocally by the end. Well, we had the support of the Youth Voice and for this, Thank you, Dahlia, and thank you to your colleagues. You were amazing. Um, the Youth Task Force, when it was delivering the Global Youth Policy Paper in their plenary presentation, included a call to governments to, and I'm quoting, introduce large-scale environmental destruction, ecocide, as a crime in the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. Bjorn Fonden from the task force um, in his plenary uh, statement said, we cannot continue living our lives pretending that nothing has changed. The global youth policy paper is the action plan from Stockholm Plus 50, and we call on you to criminalize ecocide. We also had the voice of the faiths on our side, um, an interfaith statement of 200 um, religious faith leaders and representatives of world religions um, made 10 calls to action. One of those was to adopt and implement an ecocide law and promote the faith for ecocide law initiative. We had support from the indigenous community. In a filmed intervention uh, at one of our panels, Chief uh, Rayoni again of, of the Kayopa people said, so I say so all of you, I call for the recognition of the crime of ecocide that we must obtain for the future. We also had the support from laureates of the Right Livelihood Award during the course of the conference, 57 um, of those laureates, including household names like um, Vandana Shiva, Greta Thunberg, David Suzuki, signed a message to the meeting urging governments to, and again, I quote, enhance the concepts of rights of nature and earth trusteeship in our relationship with the earth and in our political and legal systems. This includes acknowledging earth systems as living systems, ecocide as a crime against humanity and rights of nature as relevant 
and binding on governments. I'm looking at you, Isis, how long have I got left? <laughs> Two minutes. Two minutes, fantastic. We even had a nod from the highest level um, when Unit uh, Executive Director Inga Anderson stated, Ecoside has floated to the top. It's a conversation here in the UN halls, and the interesting part is the word was used by Olaf Palma in 1972. So we felt, um, and we believe, actually, that Ecoside is walking its way into conversations in the United Nations. Um, at a UNEP um, event held in Nairobi at the same time, um, simultaneously, our uh, representative was invited to make a speech about Ecoside um, on the floor. So that was something that hadn't happened before. And since Stockholm, our applications to hold official side events have been accepted at a number of um, United Nations events, including um, coming up COP27, uh, the United Nations Oceans Conference, and the Commission on Crime Prevention and Criminal Justice. So we believe the word, we know the word ecocide is resonating. We know the calls are growing. And we believe that ecocide is a concept whose time has come. Um, and that Stockholm Plus 50, despite an inauspicious start, was a powerful platform for the amplification of our very important message. I don't know, I think there might have been a few photographs that we were going to show at the end just of our time um, at uh, Stockholm. So that's Jojo Meta, our co-founder, um, speaking at the event at the Space Arena. That's Katie Surma from Inside Climate News, who moderated a number of our panels, talking to um, former President Halonen of Finland. Spanish language is very important to us because um, a lot of the ecocides are being carried out um, on the, on the um, South American uh, continent. Um, so this is a panel of our Spanish language event, which looked at ecocide law and Madre Tierra from the perspective of the Americas. And then finally, this is a, a picture of our wonderful youth supporters making their voices heard on the streets of Stockholm. So thank you for listening to me and inviting me. Thank you so much, Sue. It's really interesting to see that. We're, there are already some questions, but we'll continue with the questions after our last speaker uh, from today, our last panelist. He's Nathan Danke. Nathan is a human ecologist uh, who is currently supporting the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty Initiative. He has attended 10 uh, climate cups and was the official focal point for the youth constituency in 2014 and 2000, 2015, and the climate justice constituency from 2015 to 2021. So Nathan, the floor is yours. Thanks very much, Isis. I'm gonna share my screen because I do have a, a brief presentation to share with you all today. Um, so yeah, as mentioned, my name is Nathan Fanky. I'm based in Ibagué, Colombia, in the uh, territory of the Pihau people. Um, so just confirm that you can see my screen. Yes, we can. Thank you. Super. OK. So as mentioned, I'm, I'm working with the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty Initiative. This is a global collaboration made up of really a network of, of NGOs and experts um, all calling for a, uh, the phasing out of fossil fuel production and the fast tracking uh, of uh, progress towards you know, safer and more cost-effective solutions and energy access for all. It's already been endorsed by over 2,000 CSOs, civil society groups, uh, over 3,000 scientists. We, we're working up to um, 500 parliamentarians uh, already in, endorsing with their own kind of uh, initiative around this. Uh, over 100 Nobel laureates and 70 cities and sub-national governments already calling for this uh, treaty. Um, our participation in the Stockholm Plus 50 conference was significant. We spent months uh, building momentum with our network and our partners. Um, and we were, we were delighted that the result of this was actually some strong new language uh, on fossil fuels. And Stockholm Plus 50 became the first UN conference to clearly recommend the phase out of all fossil fuels. 
So this really built on the outcome uh, of COP26 in Glasgow, which uh, went some of the way there, but didn't go as far as calling for a full phase out. Uh, Stockholm Plus 50 also recognized the urgent need for, quote, financial and technical support to realize a just transition. So we really focused on Stockholm Plus 50 with a clear goal, which was to get a mention of, in the outcome document of that urgent need to stop fossil fuel production. And we were delighted also that the recommendations, in particular, uh, recommendation three, uh, which stipulated that we must phase out fossil fuels while providing targeted support to the poorest and most vulnerable in line with national circumstances and recognizing the need for financial and technical support towards a just transition. We're happy that all those recommendations um, are, are aligned with our own demands to phase out oil, gas and coal based on international cooperation uh, mechanisms uh, to really allow for a just transition for everybody. Um, so in the run-up to Stockholm, we mobilized our network uh, to take part in the participatory dialogues uh, that structured the conference beforehand. And we had uh, the indigenous grassroots communities, uh, peace movements, um, feminist organizations, all converging uh, around that single demand of constraining fossil fuel production and enhancing the international cooperation on a just transition. So in, in April, we've launched a Global Week of Advocacy in which we sent hundreds upon hundreds of personalized letters to the ministers that would be attending uh, and to the UN um, and, to, and to UNEP and to the UN itself, uh, always with that objective in mind. Um, we also published new research uh, in the run-up to Stockholm. This is co-produced with uh, 18 partner organizations uh, on how coal, oil, uh, and gas undermine every single one of the sustainable development goals. Um, and we were kind of trying to respond directly to the Stockholm Plus 50 priority of discussing how to achieve sustainable development goals. We felt like fossil fuels needed to be part of the conversation. Um, so this report, which is called Fueling Failure, really demonstrates that fossil fuels are not just a niche kind of, you know, there's not just a climate problem. Um, but actually a major threat to a healthy and thriving planet. Uh, we launched the report on the 1st of June. Uh, on the same day, we also held a pre-summit on the global just transition from fossil fuels uh, in Stockholm. This was an uh, associated event um, hosted by ourselves uh, and in partnership with the Stanley Center and the Nordic Council. Uh, it involved a, a Chatham House Rules uh, policymaker breakfast that was in followed by a series of um, panels that were open to the public that really illustrated the urgency of ending fossil fuel production. And we had the then uh, Prime Minister of Vanuatu, Bob Lohman, opening by video address the, the pre-summit and making a very clear uh, call um, for action on fossil fuels, which foreshadows a point I'll get to later about Vanuatu. Um, in our pre-summit, we heard from leaders like uh, Nemonte Ninkimo, um, from the Pacific Climate Warriors, we heard from youth climate leaders, uh, global debt and tax justice campaigners, uh, the Swedish Trade Union Confederation. We heard from lots of uh, doctors and medical professionals who are sounding the alarm on air pollution. We heard from senior clergy. Um, we heard from feminist leaders, uh, scientists, uh, parliamentarians, all sharing why they were part of the same struggle against the fossil fuel system and calling for a global plan to transform the energy system. We then took all of that energy into the, the official uh, Stockholm Plus 50, um, and we were really heartened to see um, Vanuatu, Tuvalu, Sweden, Finland, and, and France, all in their interventions making strong reference to the need for a phase-out uh, of our dependency on fossil fuels. Um, we also heard the UN Secretary General being very forceful from the podium and singling out fossil fuels, and particularly the financing of fossil fuels as a key target for action. Um, and we were very pleased also that uh, Vanessa Nakate, who many of you will have heard of, a climate justice activist from Uganda, had um, attended our pre-summit and then uh, in the leadership dialogues at Stockholm, used her unique and powerful voice to uh, echo um, the, the call for the end of fossil fuels. Uh, the, the joint letter from 50 Right Livelihood Laureates that uh, was, was previously mentioned 
um, also uh, called um, for a fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty as well as the ecocide uh, law. Um, so we were pleased that you know, Greta Thunberg, Nemo Bassi, Vandana Shiva, David Suzuki and others were amongst the signatories to that. Um, we felt that that really uh, helped. Um, we also took part in direct actions inside the, uh, inside the UN venue. It was led by youth activists from Fridays for Future, um, but we disrupted the main hall to, to make a point. And actually, Inger Anderson uh, noticed and came over and engaged in, in conversation with us, with the activists um, inside the halls. Like the Ecoside campaign, we also went out onto the streets um, of Stockholm bringing the banner. Um, and then we took the energy back in for the last session of the formal dialogues where we had more than five interventions from the floor calling for fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty. Um, and then as the conference drew to a close, we held a press conference to just hammer home the point again. Uh, the set of key recommendations for accelerating action towards a healthy planet for the prosperity of all, which was adopted by the UN delegates, is still unfortunately frighteningly insufficient. Um, but as I said, it is a document that is a significant step forward um, worth celebrating. It demonstrates how actually movements can affect the multilateral system uh, and, and can raise the bar of ambition, um, particularly in the run up to COP27. So uh, this point uh, about momentum, I think is one I would like to underline. Uh, since the um, Stockholm Plus 50 conference, we have had uh, major cities like Lima endorse the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty, also the Vatican, uh, and then most recently at the UN General Assembly, uh, Vanuatu um, made a historic call for a Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty. So um, we're excited by the momentum that Stockholm was able to generate and, and, and contribute to. And we're looking to carry that forward into COP27 uh, and, and beyond, obviously. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Nathan. So uh, thanks to all presenters. So now we will go to the next batch of Q&A. And let me remind you, this is just a little preview of what's in the context of, content of the PEN. You will get to read a lot more of civil society and other stakeholders' efforts around Stockholm Plus 50. And I think it's going to be a very important te text for every environmentalist to know where we are at now and also for articulating the different efforts. Uh, so Charles, let's go to the q and I've seen we have like six. Yeah, yeah and uh, Dahlia uh, and Sue, if you can activate your microphones and cameras too, uh, if you uh, would like to take part in any questions. I, I think Jorge is gone. We did know that he would only be with us for a limited time. So uh, let's take a look at the questions and uh, take it from there. So there, there is a question for Jorge uh, by Raymond Sanner. Jorge and colleague speakers. Uh, oh no, sorry. Ecocide and environmental human rights should be included in the OECD RBC guidelines, which is the most advanced responsible business conduct instrument. Do you agree? Oh, Jorge I, we have, is, I hope you can hear me. I saw several questions. Uh, in this one, of course, I think we should take it, uh, we should, the key point is, we should identify the way to implement this right. That requires a number of approaches, a number of steps. OECD can play its part. I believe that other organizations, institutions can play their parts. Countries inscribing the right into their constitution, it's also key, it's paramount, and ensuring that there are mechanisms to implement this at the country level are central. Okay, Jorge, thank you. I see two questions for Nathan. One is what connections is, exist with those who are working to abolish nuclear weapons and how many states have signed or are considering to sign the fossil fuel treaty? Yeah, thanks for those questions. Uh, so on, on the first one, um, very strong connections with those who, 
who went before us in, in the anti-nuclear weapons movement. Um, obviously, the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty as an idea uh, is largely based on the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. Um, hopefully, we would uh, learn lessons, um, both the, you know, what went well and what didn't go so well. But the, the point of using the language of non-proliferation is to um, really emphasize the significance of the threat of fossil fuels, that they are at least on a par with weapons of mass destruction um, as, a, as a threat to humanity, as a, as a sort of uh, global and shared threat that we face. Um, but also to uh, help conceptualize what we can do to avoid that. Um, so the, the non-proliferation really tracks the, the first step would be to stop the expansion of the fossil fuel industry. So that's the non-proliferation part. Uh, but then the second part would be the disarmament. So in, in fossil fuel terms, that would be um, the you know, actual the, the decline of existing production. And then a third for us, uh, is around the, the just transition. So actually, you know, um, enabling solutions and, and not leaving folks behind. Um, the question around how many states are, are going to sign. So the fossil fuel treaty doesn't exist as yet, but we have um, our states uh, such as Vanuatu, who is the only state publicly so far to explicitly call for it, who are pushing the idea but it would be a treaty that would need to be negotiated by states within the UN system. Um, but there are, without you know, giving anything away in terms of our diplomatic strategy, uh, which obviously is sensitive, you, know, you can take a look at what countries are saying um, in, in various UN fora and to see which ones are maybe more or closer to getting to the point where they might also call and be uh, leaders in, in, um, in driving forward through the UN system a fossil fuel treaty. For example, Colombia recently has been talking very strongly about um, the, the phase out of fossil fuels within its own territory and, and just transition. So that's very in, in heartening. Um, uh, and, and similarly, the president of Timor uh, Leste, uh, Jose Ramos Horta, has also been very clear in some of his comments. We've had ministers in, in various other countries. The European Parliament yesterday uh, talked uh, uh, and called for a fossil fuel uh, non-proliferation treaty. So it's building to that, but at present, it's not as if a treaty exists that countries need to sign on to. It's that they need to actually set about negotiating it. Okay, Nathan. Thank you so much. I think we have a question. It's in French. It's, I think it was meant for Dalian. Uh, it, when you were speaking, the, he said, Olive, Dr. Olivier, he said, what the presenter says is true, but how to combine economic development and sustainable, sustainable development? Dalia? you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, can you please repeat the question? I had problems. How to combine economic development with sustainable development? Okay, to me, it's really easy. We need to try to look for circular economy, be aware about the production systems and about a, the impact that the production systems have in environment. There is like a, a feeling in people about the, the difference between economic uh, development, uh, facing a lot of gaps between economical development and sustainable development. But indeed, if we look for sustainable development, we will achieve better economical development because if we know take care about environment, the most affected always will be the most vulnerable. There is a lot of gaps between, by example, developing countries and the developed countries. The developing countries have not access to a lot of technology. We need to try to share technologies for sustainable development 
to give them the right to have good productive systems. And also it's really important as consumers be aware about the impact of our lifestyles of consumption. So yeah, that's it from me. We need to try to look for circular economy. Thank you so much, Dalia. So there are lots of different initiatives by different movements, different sectors of society. Um, we would need to articulate all the different efforts. We are all, you know, like chasing a unified uh, mission, objective. So I think we need more articulation around this. So we are running out of time, unfortunately. The remaining questions we'll try to reply on the chat box. We will now continue to the last segment, the closing segment of this uh, webinar. Uh, uh, Isis, I, I, I'm yes? sorry to, uh, to contradict you, but we do actually have a time for a couple more questions if uh, you wish. Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. <laughs> okay. Um, so we have... Uh, well, I, I have like a question for any of you who want to respond from Anne Chavanon, how to reconcile the progress of Stockholm with the new energy needs related to the war in Ukraine, in particular with the reopening of coal mines in some European states. Anyone wants to take a stab at it? I mean, I think that what Stockholm reminded us, and let's not forget that it already, that it happened in June, as we are seeing this crisis, it is that fragility, it is that conflict fuels interconnected crisis. We are seeing that this is accelerating, on the one hand, the understanding of global societies. I live, for example, I was living in Nairobi for many years, now I live in Paris, I live in Europe. The European society has awakened to understanding that despite the greater ecological awareness that exists in the society, they are realizing the need to accelerate the transition of uh, energy needs. They are understanding that their energy uh, uh, systems were broken, were not necessarily transparent, and were heavily dependent. So. On the bright side, what we can see, but unfortunately, we should not need a war to understand this. It is, it is that accelerated move towards a transition of global energy systems. And we are seeing that every day with the reminders of uh, trying to go back to the past to use lessons. I do believe that the electorate will understand, the civil society will understand that as a case to move forward. I'll put that in context. The same, food, the same element, I am now in Rome in the Committee on Food Security, an inclusive space for discussion. We are looking at the accelerated connected crisis on our food systems, which are broken, which are not providing enough for everybody. We need to rethink those systems also from the perspective of inequalities. So the crisis, what they do is on the one hand, we hope that they will help us move forward to build forward better as we had the case with COVID, but also we understand the global imperative to work for sustainable development, for multilateralism and for joint solutions. Thank you, Jorge. Nathan, I see you have your hand up and we are getting close to the end of the Q&A. So why don't we let you have the last word before uh, Isis moves us on. I'll be very brief just to build on what Jorge said. I think what's happening in the Ukraine really shows that uh, war, militarism go hand in hand with fossil fuels and that a dependency on fossil fuels is not a strength, it is a vulnerability. And that is not just, not only the war in Ukraine, but, but everything that we're seeing in Europe right now around energy and around the economic crisis that uh, energy crisis are, are contributing towards. So really, it is time for transition. Okay, uh, Dan, do you want to say something? Just the last few words about this before we move on? Okay, so now we will continue with the closing segment, as I said before. Uh, we will continue with uh, our colleague, Jan Gustav Strandenais. 
So as you know, Gian Gustav has been with Stakeholder Forum for a while. He began working in, on, with the UN on Environment and Governance in the 1970s. He has been lecturing about the UN for 20 years, worked for NGOs at the United Nations in New York during the Commission on Sustainable Development years, and has carried out multiple assignments for UNEP. Earlier in his career, Jan Gustav worked as a diplomat for Norway's foreign office in Botswana and Uganda, and later on, a direct, and later on directed a large aid and environment NGO in Norway for two decades. So Jan Gustav has been uh, my partner in this endeavor, so I'm really happy to now give the floor to him. He has a lot of knowledge to share with you, so the floor is yours, Jan Gustav. Thank you very much, Isis, uh, for this introduction. Um, conclude this discussion is not easy, but I will make a stab at it. 50 years ago, as we said, UNEP was established and the world had finally gotten its own organization, which was going to deal with exclusively the environment. And this year we have tried to celebrate 50 years of environmental work. In 1972, the UN was no stranger to environmental challenges as several bodies within the UN had been working on elements of the environment. UNESCO, for instance, the Education and Science Organization had for a long time been dealing with elements of the environment. The World Meteorological Organization had been working on atmospheric is issues since its inception. FAO, <clears throat> the Food and Agriculture Organization had been dealing with challenges to food production, such as drought and pollution. And there were others as well within the UN system working on and dealing with environmental issues. But in 1972, it was the first time, as we've said, and as the PEN will tell you, it was the first time that the world got an organization which was going to exclusively work on the environmental issues, see all issues related to environment, and environmental challenges in a totality. And as we've heard today, the UN Conference on the Human Environment in 1972 was a first in many cases. It became, it, it developed an institution to deal with the environment, multilateral environmentalism began, the beginning of environmental governance, it was the first time, as we've said that civil society was allowed to address an official plenary at an intergovernmental meeting on a regular daily basis, and this changed all subsequent UN meetings. Environmental law was given an institutional home, and science and the environment was given an institutions and environmental assessments began, and we saw the beginning of environmental diplomacy. Throughout these 50 years, we have seen the legacy of the 1972 conference grow and manifest itself in a myriad of issues and policies. All this is covered in the report we're making, and as Isi said in, in her introduction, it will be available for all of you to download soon, when and if you want to. But then again, we've heard all this for nearly two hours, so it's almost unnecessary to say this again in a conclusion. Allow me, therefore, to make a postulation. None of this would have been possible without the active, creative, knowledgeable, and engaged participation from civil society and non-state stakeholders. Without civil society, which in effect is the peoples of the world, none of this would have happened in the way it has happened. Where is the evidence for this postulation? A few books have tried to catalog the contribution from civil society, but compared to official archives, documented traces of civil society is hard to find in intergovernmental affairs. If you try to do research on civil society's contribution in the 1972 conference, we met with difficulties because no one took the responsibility to document their massive input. And massive it was <clears throat> because there were three parallel NGO conferences in Stockholm in 72. There were some 10,000 participants, a majority of which came from civil society. There were well over 250 international NGOs accredited back in 1972. Well, papers have been written, of course, about civil society and non-state stakeholders in the 1972 conference, but there's no concise report of and by civil society from there. So for Stockholm Plus 50, we decided to do something about this 
And one of the key ideas behind the people's environment narrative was to document and give an impression of what civil society accomplished at the Stockholm 2022 conference. And believe me, more than a thousand people have, have created, contributed in, in different ways, directly and indirectly to our report. Preparatory documents and concept papers are given, are a given within an intergovernmental conference. And we wanted to add to the preparatory process for Stockholm Plus 50 with different initiatives. And we also asked, as you've heard Isis say and, and Dan say, we asked seven globally recognized experts to write what they thought was important within their field of expertise. We identified a theme, we called it a legacy theme and a basic framework to stay within but for the rest, the content was to be theirs. Reflecting on the past, the present and future on the environment is what you will read about in these seven legacy papers. And, there's all, and there are also more papers on various themes that relate to the environment, as you have heard today, and which were discussed at Stockholm Plus 50. This is found in the pen when it's ready. I have often listened to introduction by an official chair at an intergovernmental conference introducing and inviting civil society to speak. And more often than not, the introduction usually says that we will now hear from civil society about the need to participate in these conferences. It is as if members of the global civil society do not have anything else or substance and understanding on the thematic agenda of these conferences. And the only thing that we can speak about is participation. Yes. We have to address transparency, accountability, and participation because civil society is often barred from actively participating in these conferences. But we also have substantive knowledge and we have our own way of analyzing these themes. The pen and today's discussion speaks to the substantive knowledge that civil society and non-state stakeholders bring to the table. What about my postulation that we had not come as far as we have today had it not been for the active and engaged participation from civil society in environmental matters. Well, civil society and non-state stakeholder have an annoying way of bringing unwanted truths to the table. And we've done so time and again over the past 50 years and thus contributed to where we are now. We do not let things slide and be forgotten. And we remind time and again governments and, and <clears throat> the UN system of their commitments. We are not satisfied with present actions, but we are getting there and we will not give up what we're doing. We've been an active and impatient driver on the, of environmental issues over the past 50 years. We have brought new issues to the agenda and widened the scope for many others. The development of many of the multilateral environmental agreements have enjoyed our input, governance issues as well, and of late, the resolution on banning plastics agreed at UNEA 5 saw the active participation and contribution from civil society. Some of all this can be found in the report we have produced. We've seen the impatience and frustration of the youth groups supported by the peoples everywhere with climate issues, the loss of biodiversity and chemical pollution, which is what the UN Environment Assembly has named the three planetary crises. The UN offers platforms for civil society to express this frustration in constructive ways. A participation and a production and presentation which began in 1972 and which to today is being threatened by too many governments that want to shut up and blindfold civil society. Thus, civil society and UNEP form an important alliance in the global fight for democracy and to safeguard the planet. We've tried also to document history and pay tribute to a few people. Rachel Carson, who is credited with starting the global environmental movement with her courageous book, Silent Spring, published in 1962. Or Barbara Ward, author, economist, researcher, and activist, credited with coming up with the three basic dimensions for sustainable development. And she was the person also that made sure civil society could address on a regular basis the plenaries back in 1972. These were two individuals who fought almost alone and made a difference. Today, there are millions of us fighting for the same. Inspired by 50 years of moving forward, we will go further. Did Stockholm Plus 50 accomplish what we hoped it would do? 
There is a debate on, there is a debate on that. But if we combine the outcome from the two commemorative conferences this year, UNIPED 50 and its civil society stakeholder report, the unit we want, combine it with Stockholm plus 50, its declaration and our contribution, the people's environment narrative, and combine this further with the outcome results from UNIA 5 this year, with among the 14 resolutions, three momentous ones, one bringing nature solidly into the development to assist animal development goals, the SDGs, another one establishing a scientific body on chemicals on par with IPBS and the IPCC, and the one on the legally binding document banning plastic pollution and, and then positioning all this within the framework of the UN General Assembly decision this year, stating that the right to a clean environment is a human right. Well, with all of this, we have reason to say the outcome from these events in 2022, 50 years after the establishment of the UN Environment Programme is strong. The outcome is positive and the outcome speaks to an optimistic future despite the horrors and trouble this world is going through today. Let me finish my conclusion with a quote from a brave and courageous environmentalist who was also awarding, awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for her work, the great Kenyan Wangari Matai. She said, human rights are not things that are put on the table for people to enjoy. These are things you fight for and then you protect. And then she added, when we plant trees, we plant the seeds of peace and hope. And this is also the legacy of UNEP and this is also the legacy of civil society. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Jan Gustav. Thank you everyone for attending. I will now pass it on to Charles. So he will close the webinar and thank you again. Charles? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, young Gustav, for your very thoughtful conclusions and Isis for so ably uh, acting as moderator today and bringing everyone together. Um, I would certainly like to thank all of our guests for joining us. Uh, in particular, uh, I want to uh, thank the Civil Society Unit at the United Nations Environment Program and the Government of Sweden for their cooperation and support. And a huge thanks to Isis, young Gustav Leida, who uh, originally uh, took the uh, early reins of the project coordination uh, before ESIS took over so well. Uh, Ingrid Rustad from Forum Norway, who's worked closely with us, uh, and uh, all of those who supported us in this endeavor since January of 2022. Um, today is the last um, of the webinars for the Towards Stockholm Plus 50 project. The project will be wrapping up soon. Uh, we will, however, as mentioned, uh, be having the report. The report is not quite ready for publication, but once we do, very, very soon, we're going to have a version that we'll send to you all. We have everyone's email address from registering. It's going to be on the Towards uh, Stockholm Plus 50 website. Uh, there'll be links uh, to all of it. And as the report is updated and then finalized, when all of the content is there, we will, uh, again, communicate with everybody and we'll send it to you. We'll send a PDF to you. The structure will be that the parent document, the People's Environment Narrative, will have links to other documents because there is a lot of information uh, and it would just be too huge to make it all one document. So those of you will be able to uh, download the various legacy papers and the other content that uh, represents everything from uh, regional consultations uh, and all of the other um, linked events that were part of uh, Stockholm Plus 50. Uh, I'd also like to thank again uh, Pierre-Yves uh, Serenet and his team for providing excellent simultaneous translations, translations today. And as mentioned earlier, this webinar has been recorded, and that recording, the PowerPoint presentations, and the chat content will be sent to you by way of an automated email from the Zoom platform. It will come to you tomorrow at about the same time that the webinar started today. It'll, it'll include a, a link to the Towards Stockholm Plus 50 events webpage where you can then access everything. One last comment on the recordings. The recordings are also going to be in Spanish and French. It will take a little bit, a little while for our uh, able uh, translations team to uh, download all that and get it over to us, and then we'll upload it. So you'll have a little bit of everything. And until then, 
Uh, I would like to thank all of you for joining us today. And again, especially to my team, what a fantastic group I'm working with and looking forward to working with in the future. There, I see we have Ingrid uh, joining us now. Let me bring the, the whole team in for this last view. Uh, and I'll also uh, just bring in the uh, thank you uh, from all of us. Uh, we really appreciate all of those who have over the past uh, 10 months taken part in our webinars, listened, contributed, uh, and especially the consultations that took place uh, prior to and during a Stockholm Plus 50. So thank you all, uh, and we'll now sign off, and good luck to everyone.